Jonas. Ein Kind rot. Mach da vor Nagels. In der Vorkehr, no more, no more chickens. Please put it on silent. Please. Exits there, there, and for those who are into abseiling, they can go. Fortune of Gulier, a Gujian Okod Starul Show. Martamaj Kimora, Agus E Kiluro. It's an historic occasion. We're commemorating and we're celebrating Brigadier General Joe Ring on the centenary of his death. And I'm here following a chance meeting with Gerald Geraghty, who told me a few weeks ago that he had mass arranged for Joe Ring for yesterday. And there was nothing planned, so we decided to do something. And we took young Joe Ring, the retired Joe Ring, wherever he is now, he's there somewhere. He's there around the back, yeah, on board. And this is the result, today's lecture. We're not here to pass judgment on people or on history. We're just here to honor and remember respectfully. That's what we're doing. All our political ancestry came from the same tree with Republican roots. Then some branches went left, some went right. That's the way it goes. When I realized there was nothing planned, I had another thought. I wanted to honor another man, a close friend and neighbor of Joe Rings. That's my wife's grandfather, Ed Moran from Drummond Do because many here will remember his kind and gentle manner and more so his sense of deep loyalty. So that was one of the spurs that made me get involved in this. Our speaker today is Richie Joyce, who graduated with a history and economics degree from UCG and is currently on the board of management of Gaelskull Nacruyche. So fair fresh. And he's steeped in history. It oozes out of his veins. So I always say he is the best man for what we might term the inaugural Joe Ring lecture. Afterwards, we can have a few questions, and Charlie Keating will introduce us after that then to a song that is written specially for Joe Ring. So I want to welcome you all today to say Fauci, and especially to members of the family of Joe Rings, the Rings, the Garretys, and the broader family. And ADC, Claire, Fauci, especially there. You're very, very welcome. Yeah. So you're all very welcome. So Richie Joyce, over to you, wherever you are. Here he is. Yeah. I'm not used to really talking in public places, but I do my best. And I'd like to thank Leamy, first of all, and your and uh, the wider Ring family for asking me to do the presentation here today. Some of the questions we'll be looking at are, who was Joe Ring first? How come he was so passionately motivated in dedicating the entirety of his young life to the cause of Irish freedom. His role in the War of Independence, his role in the early formation of the Civic Guards, now in Gorda Siakana, his involvement in the Civil War, indeed, why was he so passionate about such things as the preservation of law and order, the integrity of state institutions as laid down and mandated by Dáil Léirinn, the elected representatives of the Irish people. Last but not least, we'll just talk a little on his fiancée, Mary McAllister, fondly known to Joe and her friends as Minnie, due to her petite stature. Now we first need to set the period for the discussion in some context. This is early 1900s, and the period we'll be dealing with is up to 1923. And we should remember there was no such thing as laptops, mobile phones, or the internet. The memory of the Great Famine of 45, 46, and Black 47 is still in living memory, <coughs> and summed up in that famous and sad, beautiful song, Dear Old Skibbereen. I know Charlie knows the full words of it, but it's no harm just to uh, take two verses. It regards his, this man's, this young lad's 12-year-old, maybe 10, asking his father why is he always talking about Skibbereen. And the, the, ver the verse goes, It's well do I remember on a black November day the landlord and the sheriff came to drive us all away. They set my house on fire with their crude English spleen and that's another reason why I left old Skibbereen. Now the son, after hearing all the verses down along, says, 
O oh, Father dear, the day will come when in answer to the call, each Irish man with feelings down will answer one and all. I'll be the man to lead the van beneath our flag of green, and low and high we'll raise the cry, remember Skibbery. Now some historians may set the Easter Rising of 1960 as the catalyst for the War of Independence, <coughs> but perhaps we could look a little deeper. No better place to look than West Cork at the turn of the century. The young Michael Collins, like many of his age, born just outside Clonakelty, would have listened intently to stories like Skibbereen in the 1798 Rebellion at home and in the forge of his neighbour, Jim, Jim James Santry, before emigrating to L London, where he worked firstly in the Post Office Savings Bank. In London, he joined various Gaelic clubs promoting Irish identity and culture before his return in 1916 as staff captain to Joseph Plunkett in the GPO. The old Fenian journalist and writer, James O'Donovan Rossa, now many people say Rossa, it's Ross Moore he came from, that's why they call him O'Donovan Rossa, of Skibbereen, kept the story of Irish independence brightly burning. It was Tom Clark, the elder Fenian and IRB leader, that suggested the young teacher, an Irish scholar at St. Indus, Patrick Pearce, should give the oration at the grave of O'Donovan Ross and front the rising of 1916. It is suggested that a second Colin, uh, cousin of Michael Collins, Garro de Sullivan from Skibbereen, as he had to come to Sean McDermott, raise the national flag on the GPO. Now, who was Michael Ray? Um, on the 26th of the 7th, 1881, Joe's father, Michael Ray, an RIC policeman from Castle Comer, County Kilkenny, was addressed at Shop Street, Westport, married Catherine, known as Kate Conway, from Brit Street at Westport Roman Catholic Church, the celebrant being John Begley, CC. Michael was aged 32 when Kate was aged 22. Michael's father is described as a farmer and Kate's father, John Conway, is described as Sadler. Following their marriage, it always happened, Michael was transferred to Sligo, living at, Abbots, uh, at Abbey Street. By 1887, he had been promotion, promoted to acting sergeant and by 1890-89, he had been transferred to Limerick living at Lower Mallow Street, where his son James was born in 1889. By 1891, he had been transferred to Ballinasloe as full sergeant, where his son, Michael Joseph, was born in 1891. On retirement from the RIC, the family moved from Ballinasloe to Westport, living first on Castlebar Street, before moving to Drummond Do, circa 1900. Michael died in 1913, aged 62, with his son, Michael Joseph, present. According to the 1911 census, Michael and Catherine had been married 30 <coughs> years, having had 13 children, eight of whom were still living. To his family, neighbours and young school friends, Michael Joseph Rain quickly became known simply as Joe. In January 1890. Eight, he started his formal education at the Christian Brothers School on the Castle Bar Street. From an early age, he displayed a remarkable self-confidence and organising ability. A staunch Catholic, he joined the Westport Young Men's Sacred Heart Solidarity, was a staunch GA supporter, I hope Michael remembers that, and all, <laughs> things, and all things relating to the revival of traditional Irish culture. In his early youth, he even played football for Ahagower GA Club, <coughs> uh, where widespread contacts and friendships were established. That proved so valuable when the Irish Volunteers were being formed and reorganised in Westport in 1950. In 1950. Joe Ring, from the outside, could be described as honourable, self-confident with a passion for organisation, most stubborn to a point, but attracting a personal loyalty that few could aspire to. In his youth, he was prosecuted for playing football in the nun's field, appearing before John Charles Milling, RN, charged with trespass. 
He refused to pay the fine and, gave, and would not give undertakings that he wouldn't trespass again. <laughs> now, why was Joe Ring such a passionate Republican? We, we just want to examine who would have influenced him in his early childhood and youthful dreams. So we'll have to just recall, go back for a little while to the 1900s. It was a time in the early 1900s when family, neighbours, friends and relations gathered by the fireside relating stories of times long past, of the hardships people endured through unemployment, poverty and starvation. Housing standards were poor with sanitation and medical uh, and medicine practically non-existent. It was a time when the Great Famine of 45, 46 and Black 47 was still in love and memory, when in excess of one million of our most vulnerable died by the roadside or in the overcrowded workhouse. It was a time when children of large flam families had to take the lonely immigration ship to England or America, most never to return to the land of our birth. Sadness, desperation and despair flourished in the old, while anger gripped youthful imaginations. No doubt the young Joe Ring and his youthful schoolmates listened with intent and became fired by a desire and enthusiasm to wrong historic rights. The other great advocates for change and freedom were the Irish Christian brothers. They were among the staunchest supporters of Irish republicanism. Irish language, revival of Irish athletic association. In most Christian brother schools, all things Gaelic and Irish were encouraged. Consequently, as educators, we owe them a great debt of gratitude. Now, what stories or questions would the youthful Joe Ring and his classmates have heard at Westport CB, CBS that would have influenced some such? There may be, perhaps. We'll just run through a few of them. Why were so many Irish forced to abandon the, the land of their birth at such, in such great numbers? How could such a great and noble race of people, once described as a nation of saints and scholars, and bearing such names as O'Neill, O'Dallon, Cullum Kill, St. Bridget, St. Brendan, be brought to such a da disastrous cultural, political and economic room. It was not just the results of a sudden collapse of economic conditions in Ireland, or indeed the failure of the potato crop. It was a result of centuries of sustained and systematic deprivation, neglect and exploitation of the majority Irish Catholic population. Following the defeat of the Irish chiefs in that can sail and the fight of the Earls in 1607, old Irish and Anglo-Irish peasantry were left leaderless and defenceless. The victors quickly seized the opportunity to extend English crown laws throughout the land, banished the Irish to Hellert, to Connacht became reality. The Munster Plantation and the Ulster <coughs> Plantations were implemented. Old Irish Breton laws were abolished, Dissolution of the monasteries, convents and priories took place under Henry VIII. Church lands, lands were confiscated. Property was outlawed. Here in Mayo, Borishul Abbey was plundered and burned by the Carmelian forces in 1652. Likewise, Ballantubber Abbey in 1653. On both occasions, the countryside was pillaged. Even two aged nuns from the nunnery attached to Borishul, unable to flee, were left to starve and then murdered in the most brutal fashion in what became known as St. Silence on the Furnace Lake Newport. They were uh, Sister Nora Burke and Sister Nora McGee. The body of pa Patriot priest, Father Manus Sweeney, born in Duke in 1763, is rested within the walls of, of uh, Borishul Abbey. Father uh, Manus was reared by his <coughs> grandmother at Rossmore in Newport and ordained at the Irish College Paris in 1785 be before returning home to serve the people of Newport. Following the 1798 rebellion, he spent 16 weeks in hiding at Newport, uh, protected by the people of Scherda and Glenlora, and he was publicly hung by landlord yeomanry at Newport in 1798. He was aged just 39. A similar fate befell Father Manus Conroy from Adrigu Lahardon, publicly hung on the Mall in Castlebar. Catholics were required by law to pay tithes to the upkeep of the Anglican established church. It was a tax of one tenth of the value of a person's product 
or income from whatever land they occupied. Catholics were prohibited from land purchase or owning property. They were denied education and not allowed to partake in Protestant education system. They couldn't go abroad for education or enter the profession, hold public office or engage in trade or commerce. Gaelic culture, music, dance and customs were outlawed. Parliamentary franchise was denied. Catholics could not hold effect, uh, elected office. Seminaries for, the, seminaries for the education of Catholic clergy were closed. Priests were outlawed under the pain of execution. Penal laws were designed to strip the majority Irish ca ca uh, population of their remaining land, position and influence and died, denied them the very basics of civil rights. As a result, Catholic religious practice was kept alive only by secret op open air services in ro remote areas. Same was with education. Uh, except for the head schools, there was no education for the downtrodden uh, poor Irish Catholics. As a matter of fact, the 1901 census indicates that a considerable number of older Irish parents in, the we in West Mayo could neither read nor write. By 1778, Irish Catholics would own just 5% of Irish land. They had been replaced by those loyal to the crown, many of whom were absent landlords. Now, following the 1798 rebellion, the Act of Union between Ireland and England was passed in 1800. It was law in 1801, and the Irish Parliament, Parliament abolished. Irish MPs took their seats in the English House of Commons. Irish affairs were now of little importance or concern in the Irish in the larger English Parliament. <coughs> the success of the French Revolution in 1789 greatly encouraged nationalist aspirations. Through the 1800s, we see Daniel O'Connell advocating Catholic emancipation, Parnell trying to unite the fragmented Irish Parliamentary Party with Michael David and the Land League champion Irish tenant rights. There is growing interest in matters Gaelic and cultural as advocated by Conor Nguyega, the Gaelic Athletic Association. Fenian traditions are again on the rise through physical force societies such as Irish Republican Brotherhood, culminating in the rising of 1916. <coughs> the people that went before, they sowed the seeds and lit the flame and led to the war of Irish independence and the foundation <coughs> of the Irish Free State in 1922. Now, that's a bit long-winded, but the last thing is most important. How could Joe Ring and his youthful companions not be involved in the shaping of the new Ireland? Now, Joe Ring and the War of Independence. From the turn of the century to 1916, there was very little sympathy or desire to <coughs> overturn the status quo in Ireland. Irish Catholics could readily join the RIC and did so in large numbers. It gave a steady income and a, and, and a pension to support their families. They were well respected in local communities. Many Irish, for centuries, had served with distinction and honour in the British Army. Some famous regiments, including the Connacht Rangers, the Inniskill in Dublin and Munster Fusiliers. Some 300,000 Irish answered Redmond's call to volunteer at the outbreak of World War I. Now what happened to change this? The Irish Parliamentary Party in London were advocating home rule for Ireland. Carson's objections led to a declaration called the Ulster <coughs> Covenant, the forming of the, uh, the, and arming of Ulster volunteers with cries of no surrender. A resultant reaction in the South leads to the formation of the Irish Volunteers. The majority of Irish Volunteers in the South follow Redmond's call to join the British Army at the outbreak of <coughs> World War I to support the cause of Home Rule. Tom Clark, Macdonough, Plunkett and Pearce and other IRB members <coughs> suggested that now was the time England at war with Germany to strive for an Irish Republic, leading to the 1916 Rebellion. The rest is well documented <coughs> history. Now back to Westport. Prior to 1916, there was little serious civil unrest in the country. Following the Easter Rising and the execution of its leaders, the civil and military authorities decided that any agitation or civil unrest would be dealt with in the harshest manner. 
It should be remembered that Westport was then the headquarters of the Royal uh, Irish Constabulary for Mayo, with Oliver Milling, born in R.D. in Louth in 1845 as County Inspector. Milling and his family lived at Barley Hill House just off the Newport Road, some two miles from Westport. The RICHQ was situated on Shop Street, subsequently the site of the Munster and Leinster Bank and present Allied Irish. There was parking to the rear in what we know as the old Langyard, with access to James Street and Brit Street. They also had a station at the quay. So it can come as no surprise <coughs> that clashes between the old established order and now active republicanism would find expression quickly on the streets of Westport. On the foundation of the volunteers in Westport in 1915, Ring, then aged 23, was one of its first members and was appointed OC of the fledgling Westport Company prior to 1916. There was little overall coordination, coordination of IRA activities in Mayo. True, there were meetings, drillings, parading, paradings, etc., but little organised military activity. During and his colleague, colleagues, notably Tom Derrick and Ned Moan, set out to be much more prepared to avail of any future opportunity that would strive for an Irish Republic. They started to recruit, organise and equip a Westport Active Service Company. Tom Kittrick was appointed quartermaster. A branch of Fianna Irma Starkment started with a recruitment office in an outhouse behind, behind Frank Welch's pub on Castle Bar Street, later the site of the Farmers Co-op, now the Castle Court Hotel. Many of the first young Republican recruits, such as Rick Joyce, Michael Stanton, Joe Walsh, Paddy Blaney, Butch Lampard, Jim Duffy, would soon join the rank the ranks of Quinn's Westport of Ring's Westport Company. As news filtered through of an Easter rebellion and the execution of its leaders, Ring organized a route march of his fledgling company. As a result, on the 9th of the 5th, 1916, he was arrested together with some 31 other Westport activists under the defense of the Relum Act, brought to Castle Bar, transferred to Richmond Barracks. Dublin, and they eventually ended up in the detention camp, uh, camp of Fongock in South Wales. Fongock turned into be a university for the promotion of active Irish republicanism. But as well as that, friendships and contacts were made with like-minded people throughout Ireland. It was here that Ring came into contact with Michael Staines from Newport, who was later to become the first Garda Commissioner. The general amnesty of Christmas 1916 saw the prisoners released and given a <coughs> rapturous welcome on their return to Westport. The appointment of Tommy Kittrick from High Street as company quartermaster proved most decisive. With assistance from coming to man, fundraising was, mo fundraising was most effective. Many local businesses contributed. This enabled Kittrick to successfully procure badly needed arms and ammunition that was to leave the Westbrook Company the best equipped company in Mayo. Regular route marches, training camps and drilling took place in areas such as Corrigan, Sandy Hill, Farnock, Bracken and Owen Wee. With the authorities becoming nervous on Saturday, the 9th of the 3rd, 1918, Ned Moan was arrested and appeared before Justice John Charles Milling on a charge of unlawful assembly and drilling. He refused bail was remanded in custody at Sligo to appear at Westport Court on the 14th of the 3rd, 1918. I should say as a bit of levity, it's a good job it wasn't in front of Patrick Durkin. <laughs> 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 on the day of the court hearing, Ring mustered the Westport Company and the Kushla Fife and Drum Band at the Octagon. They marched to Westport Rail Railway Station for the arrival of Ned Moan, who was under heavy escort. From there they paraded to the courthouse, where Moan refused to recognise the court and was charged and convicted, receiving a one-month prison sentence. 
District Inspector Shore of the RIC was confronted by volunteers on Castlebar Street. He approached them and ordered them to disperse. The RIC battle charge the volunteers retaliated with stones. The confrontation lasted a considerable time, with the injuries inflicted on both sides. That night, the RIC took reprisals in the town breaking windows of Hughes's, Flanagan's, Shandley's, Talbot's, Lang's and others. Teddy Welch's house, public house I should say, on Mill Street was ransacked. There wasn't a drink left in it. <laughs> Doreen, identified as leader, was arrested by armed RIC at his home in Drummondo, together with a guy called Charlie Gavin Mill Street, Willie Malone High Street, Willie O'Malley de Merle and Tommy Kittrick High Street. They were taken to Shop Street RIC barracks and charged with unlawful assembly and drilling. O'Malley, o O'Malley's case was first heard. He was remanded in custody to Castlebar Court. When the case of Ring, Gavin and Kittrick were heard, they turned their backs on the court, kept their backs on, with Ring stating, We are soldiers of the Irish Republic and do not recognise the court. Constable Butler in evidence said, on the, 13th, on the 14th of the 3rd, 1918, he heard Joe Ring blow a whistle at the Octagon Westport. Give the band marching orders and march the volunteers to the station, and then march them back to Castle Bar Street where the Martin charges took place. He said there were 48 volunteers <coughs> and the band. Ring interrupted him by shouting, what about the police that broke Shanley's window? <laughs> The three were remanded to Castlebar Court on Wednesday, 21st of the 3rd, 1918. They were then escorted, handcuffed, to RAC, to the 2 o'clock train at Westport Station. Cheering crowds lined the route. Gavin and Kittrick had their shackles removed on board the train, but Ring remained handcuffed. They were sent to uh, Sligo Jail, pending trial. <coughs> their case was heard in Castlebar on the 24th of the 3rd, 1918. On arrival from Sligo at Castlebar station, an escort of a company of Essex Yeomanry and 100 RIC constables provided security ex uh, escort. Magistrates Milling and Kilbride presided. When a man's case was heard, he received a one month sentence. The three others accused turned their backs on the court and started singing. <laughs> it didn't say what it was, or a nation once again. They were sentenced to six months in Sligo jail with hard, hard labour. Afterwards, there were batten charges on the mall in Castle Bar as the accused were led away to the chairs of the large assembled crowd. On Ring's release in September, he, he was to learn that his then widowed mother had lost her late husband, RIC pension rights because of his activity. We move on now to 1919. The military active side of the War of in Independence really commenced with the attack at Shawlhead Bay, Tipperary on the 21st of the 1st, 1919. Dan Breen and his unit were attempting to procure gelignite explosive which had been escorted by the RIC for quarry work. Two Irish Catholic constables were killed. James MacDonald, age 50, a widower with five children, born Ben Mullet, and Patrick O'Connell, single from Cork. The raid had not been sanctioned at IRA HQ. Now, the assassination of John Charles Milling. On the night of the 29th of the 3rd, 1919, John Charles Milling was shot and mortally wounded at his home on the Newport Road, Westport. He died within 24 hours. He was buried with his sister Emma in the Church of Ireland Cemetery, Westport. His killing was widely condemned at the time by clergy, civil authorities, etc., etc., as recorded in various newspapers account, including the Mayo News. Martial law was promptly declared in Westport District and the town sealed off by the military. It was the first judicial assassination in Ireland. It had not been sanctioned by the IRA HQ. Of the local senior Republican leaders, Joe Ring, who was OC Westbrook Company, Tom Derrick and Ned Moan, there was no known evidence that any one of them was implicated, ordered or sanctioned the assassination. 
While Republican activists in the Westport area well felt the wrath of Milling's law enforcement measures, most would suggest that in early 1990, the stage had not been arrived at where military activity was widespread, never mind judicial assassination. A more credible belief at the time was that a renegade gang of three, aided by widespread civil unrest, and now the ready availability of weapons, carried out a personal and family vendetta on millions. On million. All three left Westport District the following day. One went to Liverpool, returning in early 1921, joined the West Mayo Active Service Unit in the War of Independence, then the National Army, and later died of wounds he received at Kilbride, Newport, during the Civil War. Another, allegedly, went to our man, did not return to Westport in the outbreak of the, until the outbreak of the Civil War, when he joined the National <coughs> Army. He also died at Kilbride on the same day during the Civil War. The third person allegedly involved did not return to Westport again. Unconfirmed reports suggest that he went first to Liverpool in England and then perhaps joined the French Pardon Legion. That's speculation. Who were the millings of Westport? They were a family steeped in the traditions of RAC service, dedicated to the preservation of law and order. Oliver Milling was born in RD in 1844. His wife Elizabeth and family moved to Barney Hill House in 1887. Oliver had been promoted County Inspector for Mayo. He had previously, previously served at Dungarvan and Waterford. His elder brother, John Thomas, was RAC, RAC County Inspector for Clare. They were from the Christian Brethren tradition. Those who knew them and worked for them suggest they were a lovely, caring, and undemanding family. Their children considered Westport their home. Oliver and Elizabeth had nine children, among them Henry and John Charles. John Charles was the person that got assassinated, but the reason we're just going to talk for a, a brief moment about Henry is because of his Westport connections. Henry Milling qualified as a dentist in America. Returned to Ireland, married Maria Theresa Gale, opened a dental practice on Castle Bar Street in 1895, was apparently well liked and lived for a period at Ross Bay. He also carried out a dental circuit to other towns in Mayo. Due to anti social behaviour at Ross Bay, by 1901 he is living at Castle Bar Street. In 1902 he purchased a dental practice at Westland Road, Dublin and moves there with his family, but keeps the dental circuit going in Mayo each month. On the 11th of the 4th, 1903, Henry dies in a, rail, in a train derailment at Ballymoan, Roscommon, while travelling to his monthly Mayo Dental Clinic. He is buried in the Church of Ireland Cemetery, Westport. John Charles Milling joined the RIC and was a district, this is his brother now, John Charles Milling joined the RIC and was a district inspector at Belfast when appointed uh, resident ma magistrate uh, in 1915 for Mayo. His wife was Elizabeth Mackelson. He originally resided at Ross Malley, Ross Bay. Again, due to antisocial behavior, which is recorded as the breaking of windows and the setting fire to his sailing boat, and also due to heightening civil unrest, he is advised to move into Westport. He and his family take up residence on the Newport Road and was assassinated, as said, on the 29th of the 3rd, 1990. Now, moving on. By September 1920, Mayo IRA, IRA were being organized into brigade areas. West Mayo Brigade now consisted of four battalions. Castle Bar was number one, Newport number two, Westport three, and Lewisburg four. Ring was appointed OC of the Westport Battalion with Kittrick as quartermaster, Jimmy Flaherty training officer, Tom Derrick High Street was OC Brigade area, with Michael McHugh, Castle Bar, Vice OC, and Michael Roy Newport was the quartermaster. Following the riots after Bloody Sunday, Derrick and McHugh were arrested in January 21. Michael Kilroy took over as OC, Ned Moan Carabon Vice OC, John Gibbons Mill Street Adjutant, 
Sean Gibbons Key Road Assistant Agent and Jimmy Flaherty Ministry was the training officer. As with most organisations, politics and internal factions were alive and well. Many thought Ring, given his organising experience, should have been appointed OC Brigade. Ring and his Westport comrades continued to be very active in late 1920 and early 21 with training, weapon procurement and involvement in attacks on RIC personnel at Derry Killo, Cattle Cross, Railroad Bridge, Big Wall and the Lady, all of which are well documented. Nightly patrols were carried out of Westport, keeping the RIC under pressure and confined to barracks at night. The vacated RIC barracks at Thrummond is born. Following Tom Barry's successful attack on Crown Forces at Kilmichael on the 28th of the 11th, 1920, using a larger active service unit and under pressure from GHQ to become more active in the West, it was decided at brigade level to form a larger full-time active service unit consisting of volunteers from, four battal from the four battalion area, numbering between 40 and 60 personnel, with support from other companies when the IRA active service unit would be in the rear area. Now it should be noted that Barry had experience in World War I, as had two of his section commanders. In other words, they were a, 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 a very um, efficient operational unit. In West Mayo, tactical awareness, experience or training with this size of a fighting unit, unit was non-existent. Jimmy Flaherty, as a British Army veteran of wa World War I, would be the only volunteer with weapon or combat experience. Two volunteers, Jim Duffy Prospect and Patrick Murray Glenn Hess, had died accidentally with several others seriously wounded through inexperience with weapon handling and safety. These fat fatalities took place in the Westport Battalion area. Joe Ring took charge of the situation on both occasions and arranged for their temporary burial in the young infant burial ground on Cushion Hill. Now, the contentious one. The Kelmina ambush of Thursday the 19th of May 1921 in the Newport 2nd Battalion area was a disaster waiting to happen. The ASU consisted of 41 men, 22 with rifles and various of various sorts, 60 with short shotguns and 3 with just revolvers. Rifle ammunition was limited, some having just 5 rounds. The unit had been in position from 6 a.m. The engagement did not take place until 3.30 p.m. Their position had been <coughs> compromised. Discipline was lax. Warning sentries north and south had left their positions. Some were asleep, while others were trying for food at a local farmer house. The I I RIC in two lorries, equipped with two Lewis machine guns, took up position on high bridges overlooking the columns for the position. The rest is history. There was little <coughs> participation of Castlebar volunteers with the Brigade ASU following this engagement. Joe Ring, Brody Malone, Jack Kane and <coughs> approximately six others of the Westboro Battalion were not participants. <coughs> Consequently, sorry, considering the vulnerability of the selected ambush, ambush posi position just five miles from Westport, five from Newport and twelve from Castlebar, with the enemy given free and uncontested access to the high firing positions on the two bridges and the time frame the ASU were in the area nine hours. It was just luck and the brave rear guard <coughs> action of the few that saved the entire unit from being wiped out. By the end of May, the fragmented units of the ASU were gathered at Corvey, Lankill and more, some at Onwe, all within the Westport 3rd Battalion area. On the 1st of the 6th, 1921, Ring, who had considerable intelligence work in Westport, including within the RIC, was notified that a combined patrol of RIC and TANS were due to leave for letter frag via Linan to arrest local activists. It was decided to ambush them at Carrick Kennedy, which is in the Westport or Battalion area, on the 2nd of the 6th, 21. 
This time the high ground was secured. Members of the Westport Battalion to engage the first vehicle with members of the Newport Battalion to engage the second vehicle. On the day, a 17-year-old Rick Joyce was assigned to the depleted numbers of the Newport Volunteers following Kilmenia. The Lewisburg Volunteers 5 were assigned to the high ground on the opposite roadside of the position, that is, overlooking the Drummond Road by the school. The patrol was allowed to pass on its outward journey to assess its numbers. Further on, the road had been trained, forcing the patrol to return. It stopped at Derby's pub. On entering the ambush position, it was now about 6.30 p.m. The first lorry was allowed through to where the Westport volunteers were positioned. It was immediately stopped with the driver shot dead. A firefight broke out, including enga engagement with the second lorry. The personnel in the first lorry brought grenade launchers into play, but were out of range of volunteers. Others from that lorry had spilled out onto the road into the ditch with a Lewis machine gun directing fire on the Lewisburg unit's position. After several bursts, this gunner was shot dead by fire from the Westport unit on the other side of the road. A second gunner, believed to be Sergeant Cregan, again opened sustained Lewis gun fire on the Lewisburg unit. By this time, the Lewisburg units were seen withdrawn from their positions and not engaging. Ring observing this and disregarding his own safety, bravely dashed across the road some 100 yards in front of the first lorry and engaged the enemy from a hill hillock at the rear. The second Lewis gunner was put out of action. Ring directed fire then on the first lorry. The firefight had lasted nearly three hours. A grenade exploded in the first lorry, killing and wounded those remaining. The Lewis gun, now in IRA control, was used in short ports at the house, now, now occupied by those in the second lorry. They quick, quickly showed a white flag and surrendered. Had Ring not been brave enough to take quick, decisive action, and had the Lewis Gunner been able to take the high ground vacated by the Lewisburg unit, things might well have been quite different at Carrick Kennedy. There were no US ASU casualties. Eight enemy had been killed or died from wounds, and 16 surrendered. The column captured a Lewis gun, 22 Lee Enfield rifles, a box of grenades, 21 revolvers, and over 5,000 rounds of badly needed rifle ammunition. The column then broke up into smaller units in order to evade capture from the widespread military sweep the following days. A reward of £2,000 was posted for information leading to Ring's arrest. The engage engagement at Cara Kennedy was the last major action in the War of Independence. A ceasefire and cessation of his hostilities occurred on the 11th of July 1921. Now, the famous group photograph taken of the SU in the foothills of Naval Mountain is a valuable historic record of local young men who, with others, dedicated their young lives to the cause of Irish freedom in making or then downtrodden company, country a nation once again. Now, perhaps we could also view this picture in another context. Michael Kilroy is on the extreme right, Joe Ring on the ex sorry, Michael Kilroy on the extreme left. Joe Ring on the extreme right, with varying shades of political opinion, concerns and aspirations in between. We now deal with Joe Ring in the Civil War. The treaty was signed in London on the 6th of the 12th, 1921. It was rat ratified in the Dáil on the 7th of the 1st, 1922, by 60 votes to 30 to 58. De Valera and his followers refused to accept the results and withdrew. Collins established an army reunification committee hoping to avoid, avoid conflict with little success. The general election of the 18th of the 6th, 1922, gives a pro treaty majority result. De Valera is quoted as saying, the majority have no right to do wrong. Back in Mayo. Following the ceasefire of 1921, considerable reorganisation and training has been carried out. Many consider the ceasefire may not hold. Sean Gibbons is sent to Galway as, as he is an officer. As the treaty is uh, ratified and accepted, provisional IRA leaders start to take sides. East Clare under the Brennan brothers go pro-treaty. West Clare go anti-treaty. It's now a case of brother against brother. 
The majority of West Mayo Brigade under Michael Kilroy go entry treaty. The general election now among an, the general opinion now among anti treaty leaders is it is the IRA who defeated the British, so it should be them that should decide Ireland's future. The fate of Northern Ireland was another very contentious issue. The reinterment of two volunteers who accidentally died in West or Battalion area, Jim Duffy and Pat Marley, saw a huge turnout of over 2,500 personnel from West Mayo Brigade area. Every battalion and company area was represented, but politically too, it was seen as a show of strength for anti-treaty opinion. There was the famous photo taken in the grounds of Westport House recording the event. Gibbons is withdrawn as he is an officer from Galway, as are other members of the Westport Battalion, who are stationed at Redmore Barracks. East Clare volunteers under Michael Brennan, who is pro-treaty, fill the vacuum. Now Michael Staines, now a TD and originally from Newport, is dispatched from Dublin to examine the the deteriorating communications issue. He requests the services of Joe Ring, who he is acquainted with, as he is an officer for Galway Mail, in the hope of bringing anti-treaty opinion on side. Ring has offices at University Road, Galway, and later at Castle Street in Castle Bar. Staines now, Staines now gets tasked with organising <coughs> the formation of the Civic Guards. He requests Ring services in February 22. Ring resigns his post as liaison officer and takes up a position as commandant at, at the RDS called the Training Depot. The first Gorda recruit, incidentally, is Edward Kerrigan, the son of Patrick Kerrigan, who is a postman in Westmore and living at the Fairgreen. Ring takes with him his old friend and comrade in the War of Independence, Jack Kane from Gortoro, Westport. The young Kane quickly gets promotion inspector and then superintendent. Sadly, Kane dies quite young from TB. He had been engaged to a girl from Crossmalina called Lena O'Reilly. While on a recruiting campaign in the West, Ring is arrested in Westport on the 1st of the 4th, 1922, together with Pat Harlan, court register, and a Mr. Lavelle at Brit Street, Westport, while addressing a large crowd. They are detained at Castle Bar Military ba- Barracks, which is under the control of Michael Calloy. Harn and Lavelle were subsequently released. On Monday the 3rd of the 4th, 1922, Ring goes on hor- hunger strike, sending the following communication to Kenroy uh, with a copy to Staines in Dublin. It goes like this, it's documented. I wish to inform you that I am on hunger strike since 11pm on April the 3rd and will continue to do, do so until I am set at liberty. My reason for doing so are as follows. As Commandant of 3rd Battalion West Mayo Brigade, I stand lo- loyal to the oath I took to the Republic of Ireland and to the Government of the Republic, of the Republic which is all Ireland. As such, I have a perfect right to my opinion, and any action I have taken or may take, I am responsible to that government and none other. Being loyal to my oath and the government I took it to, I hold you have no legal right to arrest me or detain me, as you are no longer recognised as the officer acting for the official general headquarters of the IRA. Ring was released and joined Staines, now appointed First Guard Commissioner. Staines at this stage is in the process of moving his staff and the new Garda recruits from the RDS to the old military barracks in Kildare. This was taking place on the 25th of the 4th, 1922. Many of the senior Garda recruits <coughs> were ex RIC officers, while their rank and file were from the ASU, Ordinary Operations. They were operating throughout the country during the War of Independence. Naturally, conflicts arose, discipline was difficult, it led to what was described as the Kildare Mutiny. On the morning of the 15th of May 1922, Staines and Garda HQ, who were 
ex-RAC officers in, in mostly, arrived to inspect and address the new recruits under the command of Ring and to restore discipline and control. Ring called the parade to attention, Stan spoke to the, of the experience and service of former RAC officers. Hectic and bad manners arose from those recruits on um, parade. The army in Kildare Barracks was seized. The remainder of the day was spent by Stane's his staff, together with Ring, in discussing um, in discussions on both sides. Stane's returned to Dublin. Ring and most of the mayor recruits followed in the next two days. And hearing the news, Collins <coughs> and the government members were outraged. A company strong National Army unit with an armoured car was sent over to the barracks. Following discussions with a guy called Superintendent Liddy, he wasn't superintendent at the time, and Brennan, they withdrew. Stain offered his resignation to the government, but it wasn't accepted. He then moves God the GHQ to Dublin Castle. Stain states, a civic guard, unlike other police forces, will necessarily depend for the successful performance on their, of their duties not on arms or numbers, but on the moral force they exercise as servants, representing a civil authority which is independent for its which is dependent for its existence on the free will of the people. Moving on, shortly after that, Liam Lynch, Rory O'Connor, Cahalbro, etc. occupy the forecourt. The Civil War commences on the twenty eighth of the sixth, nineteen twenty two, with their dislodgement from the forecourt. After Griffiths dies, 12th of the 8th, 1922, Collins get killed at Bain Le Blanc, 23rd of the 8th, 1922. They are succeeded by O'Higgins and Mulcahy. There is considerable chaos in the country. By July 1922, the Civil War is raging in the province. Ring joins the National Army with the rank of Brigadier, bringing with him his old friend Jack Kane. Sean McKeown, with his HQ in Athlone, was in charge of the, West Port, of the Western Campaign. It was appreciated by National Army HQ that Cork, Kerry and Mayo would be the most difficult to subdue. Michael Collins' squad, following the Civil War, was amalgamated with what was called the Dublin National Garrison. The Dublin National Army Garrison. Paddy Daly, former leader of the squad, was its OC. They were known as the Dublin Guard Brigade. They were tasked with restore, restoring civil and legislative cons throughout the country. Now Emmett Dalton of National Army GHQ proposed the provincial campaign should be tackled in two ways. Press the IRA on land and strategically land troops by sea at different ports such as Westport, Phoenix, Passage West and Yon. Mm -hmm. This was approved. The first landing attempted was at Westport. Colonel Christy O'Malley, formerly from the Scot, was the officer in charge. Brigadier Ring, his operations officer. The Cross Channel Ferry uh, Minerva was fitted out as a troop carrier, going round the Antrim coast down to Donegal, arriving in Clue Bay on the morning of the 24th of the 7th, 22. It carried 400 troops, an armoured car with a Vickers machine gun, and an 18 pound artillery piece. It anchored off the initial ire. Uh, it had been known that the Ross Money Coast Guard station was being used to house captured Republican prisoners. Three Atlas Island hookers were commandeered. Bringing a platoon of 40 National Army troops, Jack Kane included, took the station by surprise, released the prisoners, captured the garrison, and recovered small amounts of arms and ammunition. No resistance was encountered. The Minerva landed the remaining troops at Westport, taking over the town hall as their HQ. Again, no resistance was encountered at Westport. There are two historic photographs of this event the one taken with Ring and O'Malley with comrades outside the town hall standing beside the big fellow armoured car. And the one taken on the steps of Westport House. Now, the big fellow was a reference to Michael Collins, and incidentally, his sister was a teacher at Carrigown Bohola National School and married a guy called Patrick Sheridan, mm -hmm. whose brother was the famous six foot three Martin Sheridan, a met left fame who won five Olympic gold medals. Similar landings took place at Phoenix Kerry with Paddy <coughs> Daly aboard the Lady Wicklow, landing 500 heavily armed troops on the 2nd of the 8th, 1922. Unlike Westport, 
heavy resistance was experienced and they had to fight their way down to Tralee. In Kerry and Limerick, many atrocities were committed on both sides, such as Nachnagashal and Ballysidi. Landings at Passage West and Douglas was affected by Emmett Dalton, landing 800 National Army troops in the area on the 8th of the 8th, 1922. Incidentally, Jack Kane of Gortoro was again, which was only a fortnight later, was again with the all landing. Mobile army columns were used to tactically harry and pursue IRA units. Camaros was now an operational HQ for Mayo, with Castle McGarrett used to house army officers. Ballinat town had been taken by Kilroy in a column of 800 IRA. The town had been evacuated when Lawler and Ring arrived in force the following day. They then left the following day, Tuesday, the 14th of the night, 1922, for Tubber Curry and Sligo. About a half mile from the village of Bonicondon, their column was ambushed. Brigadier Joe Ring died instantly from wounds received. Tony Lawler and five others were wounded. The National Army per personnel pursued their attackers, of which 50 were captured. The main news of the 16th of 9, 1922, aged in black, gives a vivid description of the shock, sadness and anger felt in Westport's hometown, where the news of his untimely demise became known. All business houses immediately closed and shuttered their shops, while the blinds and private residents were drawn in respect. It went on to say, state, a poll, uh, Opposition to tyranny is God's, is obedience to God, and in this certainly Joe Ring obeyed. Brigadier Ring's body was taken to Balnair Workhouse on the evening of the 15th of the 9th, 1922. His brother Jim, accompanied by Charles Hughes, Edward Harn, and John O'Donoghue, arrived in Balnair to receive Brigadier Ring's remains which were conveyed by rail to Westport Station under military escort and where large crowds had gathered. His coffin was carried by his comrades to St Mary's Church and received there by Father Patterson. His coffin, draped in the tricolour, I believe that's it there. Gerald has it, thank you, Gerald. His coffin, draped in the tricolour with cap and rank insignia, was laid in front of the high altar. The church remained open all night to, uh, to accommodate the crowds wishing to pay their respects. The following day at 11, p uh, 11 a.m., Requiem Mass was celebrated for the re eternal repose of his soul. Nine clergy from the, the surrounding areas assisted. At 2 p.m., the Irish band from Athlone and, their, and newly formed Gord the Pipe Band from Kildare Training Barracks led the sad, sad cortege with funeral remains, which included a family, a military honour guard with reversed arms, Fianna Aaron, ladies of common seer thought, men's sacred heart solidarity, his family and friends, not least his heartbroken fiancée, <coughs> Mary McAllister, known as Minnie, who is an employee of Westbrook Post Office. Joe's remains were born on the three mile journey to Javier Cemetery by his comrades, clasped, flanked by members of the new, newly formed Mayo Civic Guard Division. Father Patterson, assisted by Father McKevley Ballyhonis, Father Joyce Castlebar, and Father Gibbons Westwood, recited the graveside prayers and blessings. Michael Staines, then a TD, gave an oration on behalf of Ungar de Corner. Colonel Cooney on behalf of the National Army. The last post and rebellion were sounded. Three volleys were fired by the military es escort as a final tribute to their fallen comrade. The Mayo News edition of the 30th of 9, 1922 lists the names of chief murderers, which include, include Coast family as well as large presentation of, of floral wreaths. Now, just a few words on Mary, Mc on Mary McAllister. Joe's fiancée, Mary McAllister, known fondly to her friends and colleagues as Minnie, due to her small stature, was the Kitty Kiernan of Joe Ring's life. Mary was born on the 15th of 11th, 1894, at Drumahir, Leeds, into a staunchly re active Republican family. She commenced her PO career as a telegraphist at Sligo, 
in 1915, age 15, transferring to Westport as a post office clerk in 1920, and residing in an upstairs apartment at Upper James Street, owned by Richard Wedge, known as Blousers today, with other female post office clerical staff, who also had accommodation. <coughs> Following jo Joe's untimely device, which must, have been, which must have deeply affected her, she received much support and encouragement from Joe's family and his many friends in Westport. She transferred back to Sligo in 1935 to care for her aging mother, Annie. She retired from PO service in 1956. She never married and died in 1979, aged 62, and rests in the family plot in Carrick Chimple Cemetery in Meeting. An anniversary commemoration mass was celebrated as reported in the May News of the 22nd of the 9th, 1923, attended by Brigadier Joe Ring's family, his fiancée, Mary McAllister, and hundreds of his comrades and people of Westport. A procession assembled on GM Street. First came the firing party of 12 members of the National Army. Then the Garda Brass and Reed Band, which had travelled from Dublin. Next came a company of 50 Garda led by Commandant McCarthy then by 300 National Army soldiers <coughs> led by Major General Hogan, all marched to Avia Cemetery, where honours were laid, were, were paid. General Hogan did a read the oration and the last post signed it. One can but speculate on what might have been for many, but for the tragic and total futility of a tragic fratricide <coughs> civil war, which could and should have been avoided. Finally, I'm sorry for taking so long. It had to be. Charlie will get uh, his guitar ready and just for later on just to remind you that there are a few artifacts here including the flag that was on Joe Ring's coffin. There's a, a rifle here, his medal is here, there are a few pictures and there's it's just a holster, there's nothing in it. It's just a holster. But we couldn't bring the real thing because Chrissy Hyden is here. Exactly. And just to say that there are a lot of other artefacts out at the Westport Heritage Centre in the amount of jewellery, including this engagement ring. Including the engagement ring, right? So if anybody has any question or comment, you may direct them to the chief. Thank you. 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 Thank we shouldn't have let the day pass without some little tribute to him, and thanks to Lee me again and Gerald. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I have one question, just, uh, you, you won't be able to answer it, I know, but I, I noticed on the headstone, on Joe Ring's headstone, it says that his date of death was the 23rd of September. Right. <coughs> Yesterday, yesterday. That's why Jerry had the mass yesterday. I don't know if there's any 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 ring or Garrity member who might be able to explain that. But it's on the headstone as the twenty third of September. But we know he, he we know he died on the fourteenth. So I, I don't know where that is. Anybody can. Uh, you can see the chaos at, at the time, and I'm just offering my opinion. Uh, much has been wrote and talked about. Some of the facts, some of the fiction some of this romantic stuff, uh, but the facts bear out that at the time, uh, I think, it should be forgotten possibly about now, but there's a certain amount of politics involved, and it's only now I know our, our family, my children know it, with a very little interest in the political side of things, but it is due to uh, the likes of Joe Ring and his comrades and Michael Kilroy and all those people that had the initiative 
to just right or wrong that people for 800 years had actually failed to achieve. And but for them, we wouldn't have um, the country we have today. Yeah. Did, did I hear them saying? Yeah. 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 part of the, of, of the answer that yeah. Dr. White was asking there. Don't forget, the years that followed were very, very bitter. And people and families immigrated, immigrated from all the same. There was a lot, they carried a lot of baggage. Absolutely. And I think things were left lie. You know? I would agree totally with you, Tommy. And the Kadir mutiny for me is a typical thing. The Kerry people uh, landed in the barracks. The Kerry people that were involved in the War of Vengeance, they landed in Kildare. And Collins, who had built up a huge network of intelligence through the RIC. And the RIC like, played the wrong part in the development of Ireland as a nation. We shouldn't de de detract from their contribution. They just were were coming from a culture that was changing rapidly and that needed, that needed to change. <coughs> and many of them were confidence of Collins and indeed Ring because he had contacts in the barracks here and um, as well as uh, Paul Delahunty here was the mechanic and the electrician for the RSC barracks and everything he knew was in Ring's possession within hours. And um, it's a period that we we had to go through given the Civil War started, and maybe we've gone through the other side now, and we should um, at least honor and thank the people that came through that period. Um, we're all brothers, we're all sisters, we have a great country. The record of Minnie McAllister after his death, uh, by journalists that would have been to interview or uh, uh, talk to her about what was yeah. life or what his she activities. Didn't, she didn't leave she didn't leave Westport in the was 35, 36 I think. But she was always came back to Westport she because she had great friends, the Gibbonses of uh Le Candy. Uh, uh, she had like Tommy has said, things were bitter. And she had a hard time in Westport, uh, not alone in the post office, but in the community, and but for the Ring family and indeed her friends around the place. Uh, like Joe Ring was one of her own, he was a Westport person, and he had built up the Westport company to such an extent that it was the best company in the whole of Mayo, if not in the whole of Connacht, I would say. Uh, and that was true his association with Tommy Kittrick and all the people that were able to build it up to that level. But to answer your question directly, it was a sad affair for her because she was isolated here. Her family, Christy, actually were highly um, involved with uh, the Origna and Sligo IRA. And it was reputed that her brother was uh, in the IRA column that was being chased at the time by Ring and his. So you can see the family mishmash in the whole thing, you know. Johnny Duffy from Nakruski. Johnny was an outstanding Republican, and there's a great photo, I think, Lee Me, you have it, of Johnny Duffy, Ring, uh, Paddy Duffy, Bird Malone, and all them together. Now, um, Johnny, when the Civil War started, said, no, I'm taking no active part. We shouldn't have it. It should be avoided. He never took any part after. Now, he had convinced an uncle of mine, Rick Joyce, who was an engineer with, with Ring in the Westport scenario, that he should also go the same way. But unfortunately, or fortunately for him, uh, he resigned his position as the engineer, but wouldn't, out of loyalty, now he was only 17, 18 at the time, wouldn't abandon Kilroy in Newport. So that's the long and the short of it. Between Mike Kilroy and Joe Ring, who were originally great friends. Absolutely. 
Actually, it's a six mark question, and I think it all had to do with I don't know what you call it. Would you call it personal jealousy? Would you call it politics? Joring felt, as many did in Westport, that he should be the Brigade OC. And with the connections with Castlebar, etc., etc., it ended up. No, it didn't mean <laughs> it, it ended up that Kilroy was Brigade OC. But it didn't mean that Ring abandoned ship. He kept going with the Westport Company, and he was the OC of the Westport Battalion area. You know, it's impossible to answer that. It's not. So you're not looking back in memory. I can understand the enmity that uh, would have um, evolved between uh, um, uh, Kilroy and Jory. The two of them were parts. One may be more equal than the other. But the decision for the promotion didn't come, it wasn't made locally. That came from uh, Michael Collins' uh, uh, structure of command. It just didn't say, it was just, um, that, that came from the mind, but it was just more there. Thinking back, like, uh, and looking at it today, from my own experience when I was five, I've seen my own uncles, and some of them didn't speak, some of them never spoke to each other again. They fought it out the streets, you know, fired the high streets out. And the, 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 the treatment that some of the wives have treated out by, uh, 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 of, and some of them were very bad, wicked, right, against brother, against brother. Actually, it's, it's in, inconceivable to think it would happen today. And indeed, it could very happen again because of the sentiment of the earth. Yes. Mm -hmm. And share our house with Lagos 23, 24, because of it. And he was never forgotten. He was mentioned all the time, and loads of stories going back. But my grandfather told me, and told me about the day he went to the night to collect his body. So there are huge memories, and there are a large amount of stories that were related to us. And to my consult as well, he would be very well remembered. Okay. Can I just make a quick comment for your information? The least of the million we had this passed on, and a lot of stories from her aunt. And I know the husband of her niece, and I can put him in contact, or I can put niece in contact with the lady <coughs> that wishes to do further research and find out the stories. I come across her, I don't quite know it. She's a living child in town, yeah, and she would have said that she would have been aware of a lot of stories happening in this but Horik, it's, it's funny that you should say that because in all the books around the place, she's known as Nan McAllister. But Nan McAllister was a totally different person to Mary McAllister. Nan McAllister was a Church of Ireland. She actually signed the uh, Ulster Covenant, which was a different one for ladies. And uh, she retired, I think it'll be about, it, it's not that long ago, 59. There's a great record in the um, Mayo News of her retirement. She went back to Dublin. Now, she, her name was spelled Mary McAllister, A-L-L-E-S-T-E-R. She, she was Marie McAllister. And um, I wrote to somebody that retired in Westboro, in uh, Clyde Post Office, asking for information with the, the any photographs of Minnie McAllister and Joe Ring together. But I never got any reply. I have a phone number now that I get to give to Michael earlier. Good on you. Contact with the Michael wants to say Well, just to change this in relation to what Paul is now, it's quite important for the purpose of the uh, course we were immensely proud of Joe Ring uh, over the years. We were immensely proud of Joe Ring and over the years, I mean, in our family, both in Marvin's family and my family, you know, drawing what talked about. But as it was really uh, <laughs> over the years, uh, we should have done something properly in relation to what to honor his memory. And it's sad, really, that the only statue in commemoration to Joe Ring is down in Bully Condon, that is not in the town of Westport, where it should be. And maybe not today. And I want to thank you, Richie, and Jared, and Joe, and everybody, and leave me, you rang me a few weeks ago. 
repair and they said to me something had to be done to one other to a ring and I think from today we should uh, undo a round and the round that has to be done is there should be something in Westport to commemorate Joe Ring once and for all and I'm asking from today if not up to me I want you to go over the years people would have said to me if I had done it they would say it's a political and I would be political I kept away from that but I think the time has come now that we do something in the town of Westport to honour Joe Ring three things he was a very dear general in the army First, commissioner, the city commissioner of the police force, helped to set up the guard of the Shia Khan, and a hundred years on, the guard of the Shia Khan has backed every government since the foundation of the state, and that's something we should never, ever forget. Mm -hmm. And finally, just in relation to the McAllisters, a funny thing happened, Richie. I had to give before that they didn't get a chance to look at it. I got a letter, another letter, got a most beautiful card that you have here, sent to the doll last week, upon our Maria Payne who was a niece of many McAllister. And she, she was delighted to see the article in the Irish Independent last week. And from that article, she sent me a beautiful note that I'll give you a copy of here for the Republic today. And she, you know, they are fond members of Jory, and you're quite correct, many McAllister were her name, worked the post office, the letter is here, and uh, uh, we've been, well, I will make contact with the family. But I think the time has come that we should do something once and for all and there should be a statue of some stuff done, put in the town of Westport once and for all for jewelry because we all talk about civil war politics and you mentioned Johnny Durkin and Patrick Durkin, my good friend was here, who came, for me, came to me in 1979 to stand for the town council in Westport and the first man that came into this town and canvassed for me wasn't Patrick Durkin, wasn't Daddy Feeney Gale member, was Johnny Durkin from Knockhill Street and he knocked at the Durkin family and he said, vote for that man, because that man and his he, friend uncle, we, him and I were together, and he said, I want you to vote for him. And I said, have to say, that says the quality of that man as well, Johnny Duffy. So today, I want to thank you, Richie, thank Nimi, Derek, Joe, and everybody that was involved in this. I want to thank the people that came. Uh, it's great, and I'm glad that something has been done once and for all, but we just have one more trick to do, and I'm asking that now from this this gathering here today. So we set up a commission now and we do something about this. And this time next year, we'll have something in this town. That we'll have the army down, they came on a sad day for them, the police band came on a sad day for them. Let's bring the army band and let's bring the, 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 the army in and let's honor the men that help and have helped to set up this day. Thank you very much. <laughs>